Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to our networking luncheon. And I have a real sense of pride in this lunch because this is my brainchild. <laughs> Thank you. I think it was four years ago that I asked the staff, why don't we do a networking luncheon during the conference? So a lot of people come, and I've been around long enough to have attended ALC when it was at the Washington Hills. And anybody else ever went to the Washington Hills? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. That at, when we met at the Washington Hilton, you saw everybody. You sat, if you sat in the lobby of the Hilton, you could watch everybody pass by, and you got a chance to meet a lot of people. When we moved to the convention center, it became more difficult to meet people and to network because we would run the workshop. So I thought this would be an opportunity where we would have a luncheon and hopefully people would sit with people that they, they do not know and you would meet somebody new during the course of the lunch. So I hope that you have done that, that you have met at least one new person since you walked in this room today. And if you haven't, I challenge you before you leave here today to at least meet one new person, preferably 10 new people or more. I would also like to mention that CBCF is also coming into the 21st century. A few years before I came to the uh, foundation, we started realizing that our demographic, we looked at the age population of who attends ALC, and we saw that it was primarily people who were more seasoned. And what we decided to do is we had to look at how do we make this conference more attractive to persons who are younger so that we would not look up and 40 years from now the conference would be gone because all of the people who had been here from day one would be dead. So I didn't mean to put it that coldly, but, <laughs> but just add 80 years and you're 20 years by the first time you came, you would be 100 years. That's what I'm talking about. And so what we, have, what we have done is we've done a lot of things to try to make this more attractive to the younger demographic while still keeping people who have been attending all the time. So we want this to be intergenerational dialogue, intergenerational connections. And so this year, we, have, uh, we are engaged in Facebook and Twitter. And so you can follow our conference through both. Those of you who have Facebook, if you have not become a friend of CBCF, please do, and you'll see regular postings about what's happening at the conference. You can read about some of the things that you are not able to attend. And you can follow us on Twitter, you know, because if there's any extra stuff that we add on, like when we added the First Lady yesterday, if you have Twitter, you would know that the First Lady was going to be here. Since we started this networking luncheon, it has been very popular. We have been selling out of this luncheon. In fact, we are sold out today. We're assuming that some people got tied up and they will be in later. But today, I'm very happy that we are joined by three women who I've come to know through their book. Elaine Brown, Elaine Merrill Brown, Marsha Haygood, and Rhonda Joy McLean, authors of the Little Black Book of Success, Laws of Leadership for Black Women. Now, when I was approached by my staff about having them to speak, and I said, well, if we have them to speak, network and luncheon, will any of the men come to the workshop since their book was designed for women? But I was told that they have points of networking no matter whether you, regardless of gender. And so they will have something for males and females today. So I'm glad that men, we have a number of men who did attend come to the session today. Success is not defined by gender. So men, please pay attention to the lessons you will learn from these three women. <laughs> I'm reading the notes that they gave me. <laughs> okay, 
So today we wouldn't be able to do this luncheon for you today. We wouldn't be able to put on this great conference if we did not have great friends in the corporate sector. And one of those great friends we have is ExxonMobil. Lonnie Johnson from ExxonMobil serves on our Corporate Advisory Council. And we are, would like to recognize Lonnie and thank him for his service on the Corporate Advisory Council. And since Lonnie joined the, the CAC, he's helped to solidify our relationship with ExxonMobil. And at this time, I would like to welcome to the stage Mr. Sherman Glass, who is the ExxonMobil President of Refining and Supply. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Scott. I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be here. I'd like to uh, first take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome on behalf of my company and Lonnie and everybody from ExxonMobil to everyone here today, all the distinguished guests and all of the other visitors that we have uh, today. This is a, a wonderful event and uh, I'd have to say on behalf of ExxonMobil, it's a real, it's, it's not just a pleasure, but it's a real privilege for us to be able to sponsor this luncheon at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's 40th Annual Legislative Conference. I think that's a wonderful achievement. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by congratulating the Cong Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for its 40 years of unselfish service to America. I, I think this year's conference theme, which is celebrate the vision, continue the journey, and advance the mission is very fitting and timely as the CBCF looks back on a long tradition of excellence and looks forward to continuing service and achievement. The CBCF's contributions can be seen right in this room. As many leaders here sit here today that this wonderful organization helped develop their careers in government and in business and literally every aspect of American life. And not only are there existing leaders sitting here today, there's many future leaders that I know that this great organization is gonna to continue to help in the future. It's a great example of CBCF's focus on providing educational and career building opportunities across this great country. And we're very proud to have an association with this wonderful organization. You know, uh, we at ExxonMobil join you in your mission. <clears throat> we share the CBCF's passion for education. That's why we actually do contribute literally millions of dollars every year to the same goals the CBCF has stated of preparing the next generation of leaders in funding the education of deserving students around this country. This year, we're also proud to be supporters of two CBCF Brain Trust projects, both the scholarship program and the policy forum on education and science. This support reflects our belief that expanding educational opportunities is one of the most effective ways to increase economic opportunities for all Americans, including African Americans. I'm sure you know that statistics show that over a course of a lifetime, college graduates in the United States actually earn almost twice as much as high school graduates. As they say, the more you learn, the more you learn, the more you earn, and the more progress you can contribute to our nation's economic success. Unfortunately, according to the most recent census data, the proportion of African Americans who earn college degrees is far less than the national average. We at ExxonMobil are committed as I know you are, to reversing this trend. We're proud to support a range of programs that encourage excellence and achievement in math and science, especially in minority communities. Now, one key example I'd like to share with you is the role that our corporation took as a founding supporter of the National Math and Science Initiative. This is an initiative 
that tries to identify proven small programs across the country and scale them up on a nationwide basis to improve young people's performance in these two critical areas, math and science. Now it's interesting, after only two years, this initiative has proven to be pretty successful. The number of African American and Hispanic students that are participating in these programs today who've passed the advanced placement in either math, science, or even English have increased by 155%. Now you might ask yourself, why does America's largest energy company have such an interest in education? The reason is quite simple. ExxonMobil's continued technological leadership and America's continued economic leadership depends on a steady supply of scientists and engineers. We know this challenge intimately because ours is a technology business, as I'm sure you can guess. In fact, we have about 80,000 employees around the world, and a little over 20% of those employees, 16,000 people, are scientists and engineers, many with advanced degrees. So I'm sure you'll agree with us at ExxonMobil, we together cannot afford to leave part of our nation's most valuable resource, our people, undeveloped. The, fe uh, the federal and many state governments are, in fact, even partners in this effort. I'm pleased that Representative Payne, your chairman, is with us today, and I know he and his colleagues in the House, the Senate, the administration share a common belief and commitment that education is the most important thing we can do for future success in the world and in this country. And certainly, we at ExxonMobil certainly share that commitment. So in closing, on behalf of ExxonMobil, I'd like to just simply say thank you. We very much appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this fitting celebration of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's vision, your heritage, your leadership. We at ExxonMobil appreciate the partnership in an important effort to raise the next generation of American, African American leaders through a number of new and existing educational programs heavily sponsored by this foundation. Thank you so much for all of your help in that regard and on behalf of everybody that you help around our country. Now, speaking of Lonnie, I'd like to turn it over to Lonnie Johnson, who's our Director of Federal Relations here, works closely with many of the congressmen here and women to here today to try and seek win-win solutions for the U.S., for, for everybody in the U.S. and our industry as well. So right here, Lonnie Johnson. Well, thanks to Sherman and thanks to CBCF for having us as a sponsor today. We have three outstanding authors um, that's going to come up and present to us today, and I'm going to introduce them. Their book, The Little Black Book of Success, uh, Laws of Leadership for Black Women. Now, we just had a little discussion, and I told them, I hope there's something in there for a brother. I mean, that, you know, we need help, too. But in any event, they're going to come and talk to us, and they've assured me that they have something in that book that's going to help me out so I can take Sherman's job uh, when, when he leaves. <laughs> We're not trying to rush you, sir, Sherman. <laughs> okay, the first person is Elaine Merrill Brown, and they're going to come up as we... Uh, Elaine is an Emmy Awarding winning uh, media executive and author. In her 20-year television career, she's won uh, numerous awards, uh, former VP and creative uh, in, of creative services at HBO. Elaine. Joining her and one of her co-authors uh, is Marsha Haywood. Haygood, I'm sorry, Marsha. Marsha is founder and president of Stepwise and Associates. Uh, she's a career and personal development coach and motivational speaker. She's going to help me with Sherman's job. Um, and we will welcome Marsha. And the person that sort of pulls it all together, <laughs> that's, what, that's what they told me, uh, is Rhonda J. McLean, Rhonda, Rhonda Joy McLean. Rhonda is Deputy General Counsel 
of Time, Inc Time Incorporated. Uh, in the law department, she's a manager, and some of her clients include uh, Time, Fortune, Money Magazine, InStyle, Sports Illustrated, and most of all, she is a classically trained musician. I wish we had some in here she could play, but <laughs> in any event, these are the ladies that's going to present to us today. After their presentations, we will have a brief question and answer period, and I look forward to coming back talking with you then. Testing, testing. Does this come on? Auto? Yes, it's on. it's on. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for coming to the network luncheon. I want to thank Dr. Scott and Lorena Matthews of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for the invitation and having us here, and for Mr. Lonnie Johnson for bringing us up on, on stage. First of all, we are truly grateful, we're privileged, and honored uh, to be here with you this afternoon. Just to start, our book was published in March of this year. And already it's in its third printing. And to date, we've sold over 16,000 copies. Yay. Thank you. And it's really a testament to how women are embracing our book, how women are really feeling empowered and inspired and encouraged and motivated by the book to either begin or continue to pursue their leadership journeys. And what we have found in the beginning when we first started to present to groups, of, of course, most of the people in our audience were women, but we also found that there were a handful of men. <laughs> and after we would speak, you know, the brothers would come up and say, you know what, I really found your book to be inspirational. Or, you know what, I really found your book to be interesting. Or, you know what, I really feel your book didn't just speak to women, it spoke to me as well. And then they would continue to have us sign their book for either their wife, or their sister, or their girlfriend, or their aunt. And now, men are actually having us sign the book specifically to them, and that's really <laughs> making us feel great. So, so not only are men beginning to embrace the book, we're also having corporations uh, contact us because they want us to speak to their di diversity and inclusion groups, human resource professionals, hiring managers, they want a chance to better understand how different people are thinking, especially now as the world is becoming more global. Understanding differences is becoming more and more important. So and also, just a sidebar and a personal note, I feel really blessed to be here today because I was here in 2004 at the caucus at the Authors Pavilion with my first novel, Lemon City. So who knew, fast forward six years from then, that I'd be here speaking to you today with my co-authors, read a new book, Marcia Haygood and Rhonda Joy McLean. Actually, writing this book was part of my leadership journey. Lonnie Johnson introduced me as a television executive, as, as an author, and as a creative person, I never really saw myself as a leader. I always thought leaders had, you know, the MBAs, they were the suits, the pantyhose, the pumps, <laughs> they were in conference rooms, they were creating strategy for the rest of us to execute against that strategy. So, to my surprise, I was invited to attend a leadership class by HBO. And I was very excited and, and curious at the same time. And it was while I was in this class that I discovered, oh my goodness, leadership can be taught. Leaders aren't just born, leaders can be made. Leadership can be learned. There are skill sets to leadership, like there are in, in math and reading and English, and I actually possess some of those leadership skills, and yet there are other skills that I need to learn. And that's actually when the light bulb went off, because I thought, imagine how many black women who have great jobs and are in great careers, but yet they may not have the access or the opportunity or the resources to tap into their leadership potential, how much further along in their leadership journeys and in their careers they would be. Oh my goodness, I must write this book. <laughs> One of the things they teach you in leadership classes is to network. And I actually learned how to network. I mean, I thought I had been networking, exchanging business cards with other people, but networking is really about establishing relationships. So one of the first things I did after taking this class was to invite a group of women to dinner. I reached out to a senior colleague at HBO and she invited another colleague at HBO. 
I reached out to Jerry Warren Merrick, who is a senior executive at Time Warner Corporate, and Marsha Haygood, who I met at a previous networking session. I didn't know Rhonda at the time, but Marsha invited Rhonda Joy, who was an attorney at Time Inc. We all worked under the Time Warner umbrella, but in different divisions. And this dinner was actually the first of many dinners. We decided that we wanted to meet quarterly. It was a wonderful experience, not only talking about business, but about families, and it was a great opportunity to bond, and we called ourselves Girls' Night Out. So when it came time to write this book on leadership, I realized that leadership is much bigger than me, and that perhaps I would need help to, to write this book. I actually invited the group to participate in this writing project, and Marcia and Rhonda stepped forward and stepped up to the challenge, and two years later, the little black book of success, Laws of Leadership for Black Women. Thank you. Thank you very much. So leadership can be taught, leadership can be learned, leaders aren't just born, leaders can be made. Each of us should tap into and maximize our leadership potential. We should teach our young people leadership skills. We should teach our children leadership skills. And networking, which is a part of our book, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, is obviously very important. Uh, there's an effective way to network. And if it weren't for networking, the three of us wouldn't be here speaking to you today. So more power to networking. Like Dr. <laughs> Scott said, reach out and touch someone and stay in touch with people who you didn't know before. So I'll pass it on to my co-author, Marsha. Hi. Um, I'm, first of all, just thank you so much for even coming to listen to us. I hope you're not here just for the food, but also <laughs> not just for the luncheon, but also for the networking opportunity as well. Uh, I'm Marsha Haygood, and I have been a career and life coach for a number of years, but decided to start my own company where I could coach senior folks and middle level people who really wanted to get into their um, move to the next step. My tagline is moving forward with purpose. So when Elaine asked me to be part of this writing team to uh, really talk to people about some of the things that we've experienced as we were climbing up the corporate ladder, I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, I'd been a human resource executive for about 25 years, and one of the things that I found is so often is that I saw people really trying to navigate the hallways of success and sometimes making some avoidable mistakes. And part of those mistakes were the fact that they didn't ask anyone. You know, oftentimes we, we talk amongst ourselves about some of our cultural differences. And one of those is that, you know, we're a pretty suspicious bunch. You know, oh no, I shouldn't talk about that too soon because if I tell people, it won't. Hello. <laughs> if I talk about it too early, then people will know about it. And we tend and we tend not to tell people what we're trying to accomplish. So working as a career coach, I get to hear some of the things that we're trying to accomplish. And I thought that one of the things that would help us is by writing this book, talking about some of the things that the three of us have faced and probably most of you have faced, that we could sort of bring it out in the open and talk about it. Uh, we tried to make the book an easy read. We tried to make it quick. We wanted it to be motivational and not just talk about the things that didn't go well, but some solutions that would help us so that you know you're not alone and that you know that you could move forward in whatever area that you wanted to. We start off this book talking about being a VIP and understanding that self-esteem is so important, understanding that the things that we have to offer are important and sort of standing up for that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, one of the ladies as I walked around the room said to me, well, what do you do when you're the only one in the room? And, and, and I said to her, you walk in that room like you own it. Yes. But you have to develop 
that and not doing do it in an arrogant way, but do it so that you feel real comfortable with that. So we talk about little things like that that are helpful. I'll let Rhonda Joy sort of take it away from here. Hello. Maybe. Come on now. I'm from North Carolina. I don't play this stuff. I'm from North Carolina. Wake up, sit up, let's get together. This is networking. We're going to network with you. You're going to network with us. And you're going to network with each other. Am I right? Yeah. Can I get an amen? amen? All right, here we go. Um, the first thing, we need to know some information about you. How many of you are students of any kind? Just raise your hand if you're a student. How many of you are working part-time? How many of you are working full-time? All right. How many of you have been working one to five years? Five years or less. How many have been working five to ten years? Ten to twenty-five years? Twenty-five years or more? Okay. How many of you are retired? Good. This is very helpful. Thank you. And notice many people raise their hands more than once. That's quite all right. We're a multifaceted, we understand. Um, I am Rhonda Joy McLean. Uh, I am an attorney. I've been practicing for 27 years. Uh, my parents are music teachers, which is where the music comes from. Um, I was born in Chicago, but I grew up in, yes, yes, hey. And I grew up in North Carolina. <laughs> and now I live in New York. I've been in New York 25 years. It's, yes, okay. It's been my great privilege to work with Marsha and Elaine to put together the Little Black Book. I cannot tell you, it took us four years to, uh, three years to put the book together and get it published. And we now have been working on it um, almost a year, last year since it was written and actually turned in for proofing. So it's quite a long process writing a book, and um, you get to know each other really well. Um, Elaine talked to you about the dinner that she initiated, the girls' night out. We meet quarterly. That was 10 years ago. We are still meeting. So we still network and we still support each other in life and in our careers and in our new businesses and business launches. And what we're going to be talking to you about is ways that you can navigate your way to leadership success and also create a success team. People who love you, who believe in you, who support you. So whether you're the only one of whatever it is, whether you're the oldest one, the youngest one, it doesn't really matter. You should have enough confidence in yourself that you're able to lead you, because that's the first person you have to lead, right? You have to lead you, and then you can lead others. And in this world, you have to be able to lead people of many different backgrounds, many different belief systems, many different ages and genders and just you know we just had an election this week people whose political beliefs may just not drive with yours and so one of the things a leader does is you're able to find what we have in common and then work from that base to get the work done and move the mission forward. So we are delighted to have you here. We're going to speak to you a little bit, tell you some of our favorite tips from the book. We're going to give you a chance to speak to us. And um, we actually have a little something to give to you, so don't leave too soon. We have a treat for you. I'll turn it over to Elaine. To pick up where Rhonda left off. One of my favorite chapters in the book is, regardless of your position, learn all you can about your department, your company, and your industry. And I just have to say, I, you know, I've made every mistake in this book, so I've learned a lot of career and life lessons over the past 20, 25 years that I've been working as a television, television executive. But oftentimes I'm guilty of coming to work, doing a great job, just getting really stuck in a routine going home, getting up the next day, coming to work, doing a great job, and as long as I was doing a great job in the life, and I was getting paid for it, life was good. Um, but what I was really missing out was an opportunity to grow. And when we've been on the road, we hear young people just say to us, or women just say to us, you know, I feel like I'm kind of stuck. I've been in this position for a while, and I kind of watch people sort of get promoted over me, or you know, I don't know what I'm doing wrong or I'm training someone and they're getting promoted over me, whereas I should actually have that job. Don't know all the details of that kind of situation, but I do know that stepping outside your comfort zone, 
belonging to professional organ organizations, getting out and meeting other people, subscribing to, as a creative person, I subscribe to the Harvard Business Re Review. I didn't think I needed to know anything about business as a creative person. Why do I care? Obviously, I should care because what happens in the outside world and in, in, in industries is going to impact my company and also my position as well. So staying on top of changes that are happening in your industry, you know, the Comcast wanting to buy NBC Universal, how that's going to impact the television industry, those kinds of things, reading the business section of the Washington Post or the New York Times, regardless if you work in, in you know, insurance or IT, it doesn't matter. Staying on top of the business is, is really key. Attending industry organizations is where you network. That's where you get a chance to meet people who are in, in your industries and other kinds of uh, companies. Um, it's also an opportunity for when you are looking for a job, you do have people that you can contact who work in other places. Uh, the time to look for a job is not when you don't have a job. The time to network, I'm sorry, the time to network is not when you don't have a job. The time to network is when you do have a job. And I know what we have a tendency to do is gravitate towards people in the room who look like us. And one of the things we talk about is to really expand your network. To Rhonda's point, the world is becoming more diverse. You just don't want to lead people who look like you. You want to lead a diverse team of people because that's where the world is, is, is moving. So, and each of us has a mentor or sponsor who's you know, not the same gender as us, not the same race as us. We have a really a diverse group of people. And in the book, we, we refer to this group of people as a success team. It's really important to have a success team out of the success team is where you find your mentors and people who you can really talk to. Uh, Marsha talked about we don't really ask enough questions. Well, if you don't want to ask someone in your immediate uh, company, you know, perhaps you feel safer you know, uh, asking someone who's outside your company. So we really, I feel, we really need to do more of the kind of networking and Marsha can talk about how to effectively network, but that's a little bit more, um, inclusive in stepping outside of our comfort zone and talking to everyone who might be able to help us reach our leadership goals. I'll just add to that because I think that so often we think we're networking when we go to an event and we exchange cards and we put that card in our purse and or in our wallets or in our pockets. Guys, I'm remembering you. I know you're not carrying a purse. We see you over there. Um, but you put it in and then you clean that out a few weeks later and it's a little crumply, a little dirty, and you say, who is this? You don't even remember that you met them. And there are few key tips that we talk about. Um, you don't need to collect 500 cards when you're in a room with 500 people. You need to talk to a few people and really do more listening than you do talking. Um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with taking your pen with you so you can write a little note about something that they said on the back of their card and the date of when you met them. And then doing some follow-up. You know, we go to events all the time and we were laughing because we were saying that our database was pretty big, but we now pay attention more to that because we actually call people, we follow up, we send an email, we say thank you. And just, if you can remember just a little something that that person said, it makes them, helps them to remember you as well. So networking takes on another level. We have to understand that if we change our actions, if we change our mindset, even about networking, then we can change our actions and that we can get some different results. And to leverage those contacts, that does not mean that you're calling and asking people for something. And I'll give you an example of that today. A gentleman here, Kevin, where are you? <laughs> Kevin came up to me and said, I know you. We've never met in person, but we've talked and we've emailed. Someone gave me your name a few years ago, and I've referred clients to you, and he named some of my clients now. Well, I've never met Kevin before today, 
But that's a way that you can talk to people and leverage some contacts. I said, take some of my cards now so you can <laughs> send, send let's, some, hire let's hire Kevin. But definitely do those type of things. And you're in a room with people who want to move ahead. How about asking them how you can help them versus how can they help you? And doing things like that. You know, I think that we need to move forward with purpose, as I said, that's my tagline, and I really believe that. Um, I'm fortunate in that I've had a good career, climbed up the ladder in the corporate arena, and was able to leave a company on my own and start my own company that's been pretty successful. Uh, I'm living my dream, and my dream now is to help other people live their dream as well. And it's the reason that this book was so important. Every one of the 40 laws means something. Success means something. And success is really about what you want, not about what the other person has or what the other person wants, you know, and what the other person drives and how big the other person's house is. It's about making some conscious decisions on what's important to you, how you align your life with your values, and then moving toward that. And that takes time, that takes planning, that takes purposeful moving forward, that takes str strategy, and we talk, we remind you of that. None of these things that we talk about in the little black book of success is new. There are no revelations here. But they're friendly reminders. They're gentle reminders to tell you that you can do whatever you want to do. But you have to sort of match your attention with your intentions. And when you can do that, you can move forward and do anything that you want to do. Rhonda? Thank you, Ms. Marsha. I want to talk a little bit about three things, the structure of the book and um, the PLN, which I'll explain, and then give you some tips. We're hoping to give you, or at least share with you, not like you don't already know some of these things, but remind you, as Marcia said, of some practical steps you can take to move yourself forward no, no matter where you are along your career journey. Um, we've all been working for 30 years or more, although we're quite young. We started when we were babies. Um, so we, we just want you to know that. Um, but the, we felt, and it was Elaine who did the research which led us to write the book, there are more than 7,000 books about leadership. There are very few books about leadership from a black woman's point of view that talk about what our lives are like as leaders in corporate America and about us and for us. So we felt that we should address that gap. There are several other books out now that are all great, but our book is really meant to be a mentor in your pocket, or as someone has said to us, a sister friend in your purse. It is some, it is, we speak directly to you. The way we're talking to you now, the book is written from that point of view. We've actually had people stand up at sessions like these and say, your book saved my job. You know, so-and-so had said something to me, I felt insulted or offended, not understood, undervalued, and I think most employee opinion polls will tell you it's not really about money. What people want is to be appreciated. And if you don't feel, look at all these, I feel like I'm in church now. I got an amen thing going on. But it's really true as a manager, I know that I really work hard to make sure that my direct reports know that I really value what they bring to the table, how they help me and how they help us get the work done. So one of the things we tried to do was to address these concerns in the way the book is set up. There are 40 chapters each law has its own chapter, some are longer than others. Each principle is a leadership principle that no matter who you are, whether you're trying to run your family reunion, whether you're trying to run your sorority, your fraternity, your community organization, your PAC, um, it does not matter. You, leadership is leadership. In order to lead, there are certain things you need to be able to do. One of them is you need to be able to stand on your own, make a decision, and see it through. By the same token, you need to be able to collaborate. So it's sort of interesting. You need to be able to stand on your own in the face of conflict, 
May I just say, President Obama does it every day. So you really need to be able to do that. But separately, you really can't do it all alone. It's just not possible. So just as we worked together and we have debunked the myth of black professional women not being able to work together, we've been friends for 10 years. We worked for three years to write the book. It's a year since that we're still speaking. We're still getting along. So we really can do many great things together. So in the chapter, we have a principle, a, some context around the principle, cultural code. These are some things sometimes we can do a little self-sabotage. You know, have you ever gotten in your own way? You know you should have done this, instead you did that. You know you should have done a little more research before you applied for that job, but you were like, oh, I'm just gonna do it anyway. Or, you know, you know, and I do the same thing. So we try to address that. What are some things we do that get in our own way? Or God forbid, what are some things that other people do? to get in our way. And then we try to prescribe some techniques for moving beyond those obstacles. It's not like you're not gonna have them. Life wouldn't be life without challenges. It's how you meet them and how you move forward that shows what a true leader you are. Then what we really love is we have at the end of each chapter, mama-isms, things your mama told you things your Sunday school teacher told you, things your scout troop leader told you that you probably didn't want to hear at the time. I don't know about you, I used to say, you know, just give me the whipping. I'm just, let me just go to bed. I don't want to hear any more lectures, mom. But those things stay with us. They're still applicable, and we have a few mama-isms at the end of each chapter that we hope will be useful to you. And I'll, at this point, I'll turn it over to Elaine. Okay, I know that's... Testing. I know that's a segue to mom isn't, but I just want to touch upon something before I talk about that, Rhonda. Um, you mentioned self-sabotage and the cultural code. Each chapter has what we call a, a cultural code, and one of the things I know that we sometimes tend to do is react emotionally in a situation. Sometimes if we receive feedback or information that's not exactly positive or pleasing to us, sometimes the tendency is to to react emotionally as opposed to staying strategic. I mean, we've all heard about, you know, IQs, but how many people in the room have heard, know about EI? Emotional intelligence, yes. And that's also something that's relatively new to me as well, but we have what we call a 24-hour rule, that if you hear something, get a piece of email, you know, you don't particularly like, somebody in the office is trying to distract you or, or trying to, do something behind your back. It's just not to react to it emotionally and try to stay focused and strategic, take a step back and think about the different sides to the story, do your homework, do research, because sometimes that's what gets in our way. Because there's already a myth out there in terms of the angry, you know, black woman. There's always, there's already sort of an un unconscious uh, bias, if you will. So these are some of the things we talk about from a cultural perspective, some of the things that we tend to do that hurt ourselves, whether it's, you know, body language or just how we respond in certain situations. Um, oftentimes as women, we don't always speak up in meetings. Um, you know, we're raised as women, females to be quiet, sort of stay in, in the background. And we talk about, you know, being in a meeting and speaking up, being as assertive and going back to chapter number one, always consider yourself to be a VIP. Um, just to, you know, sometimes we have to constantly remind ourselves how important we are in the work environment. But going back to mamaisms, one of my favorite mamaisms is, I mentioned emotional intelligence, is always take the high road. Um, that's always been something that's resonated with me because I've been guilty, yes, of, of sometimes reacting emotionally or taking things personally, which, you know, we should try to maybe be more objective than subjective in, in the work environment and really just think, keep our goal in mind. I mean, Marsha, always says, you know, start with the end in mind. What do we want to accomplish? Where do we want to be? What do we want to achieve? And just make that our focus and not other kinds of distractions because there are people who may, you know, intentionally do things to get in our way to prevent us from moving forward and advancing and just to be aware of that. But always take the high road is one of my favorite mama-isms. I want to talk about a couple of things. Um, first, let me tell you about my favorite mamaism and, and give you some context for it. One of the things that people say about me is that I'm a pretty good planner. Um, 
we'll, we said we were going to tell you about a PLN, and that's a personal leadership notebook that we suggest that each person has that they can write down things that they do, their accomplishments. It's not a diary. It's not write everything you do every day. But those things that you really want to be able to keep track of. Oftentimes, you're ready to write your resume, and you say, what was it that I did? I know I had some accomplishments way back when. Just starting to keep track of those, things that people tell you that are important to, for your your career, that you pay attention to those so that they're down, they're documented. If you're going back and having a feedback session or an evaluation session with your boss or others, you can actually go back and you have some documented things. I did this, it saved this amount of money. I did this, this is the results of those. So having a personal leadership notebook is important, and Rhonda will talk more about it because she has a little pretty pink one that she uh, uses often. Uh, but when I talk about my mamaism, my favorite mamaism, and I love them all, we have about five for each chapter that we have. We put four or five at the end of each chapter. But my, my favorite, and it continues to be my favorite, is keep your bags packed and your purse in the ready. <laughs> and what that means is don't let other people make decisions for you. If you make a plan, if you're working at an organization and you know we're having economic problems and downsizing, don't wait until you get laid off to say, now I gotta write a resume and I have to make these calls to these people and network with people that I met three years ago and I've never called because I was too busy. You know, start making a plan now. Make a plan A and make a plan B. There is nothing wrong with it. If you have the job you loved, that is fine. But don't let that be the only thing you do. So many people say, I didn't have time to network. I was too busy. Absolutely the wrong answer. If you're not networking, it's not because you want another job that you're networking. You're networking because you want other people to know what you do. They will help you to move ahead and learn even more about what you do. So we keep your bags packed and your purse in the ready means just that. The area that I do want to mention, though, and I don't want to leave here without talking about ask for and ex asking for and accepting feedback, because that's so key. You know, we've heard often that people say that in the workplace, they're not getting feedback that's really helpful to them. And we ask often, are you asking for it? And are you open to it? Because so often you ask for it, and when people tell you, or start to tell you, what they really think, you know, you know, we can do that head roll thing. We can get really annoyed. We can, you know, stand up and say, no, 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 that's not right. If you don't agree with something that someone's being said, as Elaine and Rhonda have said, take a step back and give it some time to just think about it. What portion of that may be true? You know, I, I have a little thing that I do with clients, and I, I ask people, tell me one word that you would use to describe me. What's that one word that you would use? And then sort of make a list of those and see how many of those you really think are right. If they're not, it might be a branding problem. You have to develop your own brand. You have to be open to making some tweaks when necessary. So we talk about those things as well when you ask for and accept feedback. Rhonda? I'm going to get up for this one. Uh-oh, so that means she's going to start preaching. <laughs> I'm not going to start preaching. Can you hear me? Is it on? Yep. yep. Are we good? Well, I'm the tall one in the group, as you can tell. And I feel that it's, as the height-challenged member of the team, um, they assigned me a couple of more controversial things to speak about. And um, actually, that's not true. We, each of us, each time we do these talks, um, our audience is a little different. We talk with students, we talk with retirees, we talk with book groups, um, we talk with um, employee affinity groups and corporations. And there are some things that are true for every group, but there are other issues that are more specific. Here are two that I think are important to mention that often set us 
us back and we don't ever speak about it and we may not even be aware of it. One of our chapters is called Don't Be the Office Mammy. And some people got a little annoyed. I really lobbied hard for this chapter. Um, I think it's very important. You know, there is a historical stereotype of black women as the person who takes care of others. There is nothing at all wrong with that. It is biblical. It is a wonderful, wonderful privilege to be the nurturer. However, as someone who used to be the office mammy, I was always running to fix it, running to pour the coffee, bringing in the donuts, bringing in the pizza. Sometimes my my, my, my substantive presentation wasn't even ready. I was so busy getting the napkins for the room. Um, excuse me, you're not gonna get promoted getting the napkins. It's not gonna happen. So I think one of the things that we need to do is stay focused. What is your mission? What is your role in the office? There's nothing wrong with helping other people, but if your office, like my couch was warm, I should have had office hours, people were coming in, talking about their boyfriends, their girlfriends, their church problem, blah, blah, blah. Excuse me, you are not going to be promoted to be a leader if your work is not getting done because you're taking care of everybody else's business. Do not be the office mammy. I don't know my brothers what to say. I don't want to offend you. I don't know what the analogous character is, but you know what I mean and you do it too. But I do think that men seem to do this differently and a little less. This seems to be very common among all women, not just black women. Every place we've spoken, and we've spoken in very, very integrated groups, people understand this concept that you really need to stay clear about why you're in a workplace. You're not in a workplace to run off the church programs and stay on the phone an hour and talk with Deacon Hill. I'm sorry, I'm not promoting you. It's not happening. Are we communicating? All right. So that's one of the things. The second thing is to take that step a little further. Someone asked me here, um, Zanuya, to talk about religion. And we do have a chapter that says the values you're taught in church may not always serve you in business. And people always, my own, you know, my father's a deacon, 60 years, my mother's minister of music, 52 years. So you know I had to be careful with this one. But the truth of the matter is, no one's telling you to step aside or step away from your spiritual principles just because you work in corporate America. I know I got very, very poor uh, evaluations at my first law firm because I came directly from, you know, the South. I went to law school in the North and then went to New York for my first job at a firm. They told me, quite frankly, that I would fail. In my performance evaluations, they said I was too nice, I was too polite. In other words, I wasn't a snake in the grass and therefore I could not be a good attorney. Can you imagine someone actually saying that to your face? You have to be a devil to be successful? I'm like, that can't be right. And I'm here to tell you, it's not right. You can be true to your principles, you can stand up for the right thing and be a leader anywhere you want to be one. Now, at the same time, Here's a take that we have in our book about the values that you're taught in church and what goes on in the business world. I was always taught by my Sunday school teachers, you know, turn the other cheek, you know, forgive and forget. And so I'm here to tell you, you can turn the other cheek if you want to. I'm leaving that up to you. I don't want to get in any trouble there. But if you I certainly agree that you should forgive because what Elaine and Marsha both have said, we get held back. If you hold grudges against people who mistreat you, who's hurt? Not them, because they're moving right along with your stuff, which they stole and credited, didn't credit you for. But if you hold on to that, you're the one who suffers. But I'm here to tell you, if you forget, then that person could then, you know, hurt you the next time again or hurt the next person. So what we're saying is, Pay attention. Keep your eyes open. In every work environment, there is a certain culture. Information is passed around in a particular way. Decisions are made, not just in the boardroom, on the golf course. You know, at the Friday evening, you know, beer and chips. I don't like beer and I don't need chips, but I go to the Friday afternoon beer and chips. Why? That's where information is shared. That's where teams are created. You know, Lonnie is there, and Lonnie's saying, oh, 
I like that Amber, you know, she's really great. And he doesn't care whether she had the beer or chips or not. The fact is she's there, she's showing she's a team player, she's interested, he's gonna want her for his team. So when the new energy mission comes, the big project, Amber's in. So there's a way to do it so that you're true to yourself, uh, we have many friends who don't drink who come out with us. They have sparkling cider. We have, I'm not telling you what we have, and we have a lot of it. But the point is, there is a way to be true to you, and be a leader of diverse people of all backgrounds. I don't believe it's a sellout to work in corporate America. I believe that we should be everywhere everybody else is. We have great things to come to the table. Can I get an amen? Um, we're actually running it a little bit out of time, but we do want to stay around to entertain any questions you may have. We have someone with a microphone who will will take your questions, and we will be here to answer any questions that you may have. Please do not be shy. Take advantage of us being here. Yes, yes. there she is, the lady, lady in red. red. Perfect. Let's get us started. Oh. I really enjoyed your presentation. I think you gave us a lot of useful information. Your book is available here. Oh yes, there. it's actually being sold um, at the Authors Pavilion. Actually, we're, we're going to make that announcement before in closing. But one level down, Hall E, in uh, booth 107, and right after the luncheon, the three of us will be downstairs, more than happy to sign. Um, for those of you who have other sessions, we have a, a basket. We'll have a basket on the table. Please feel free to drop your business cards um, in that basket. We would love to stay in touch. We have a, a website. Please feel free to contact us. We do respond. And please, when you do read the book and when you do hopefully love the book, please remember to write uh, reviews on Amazon.com. That would be really yes. great. Thank you. We'd appreciate it. Another question? Hi, my name is Olivia, and my husband and I are from Los Angeles, California, and I um, just completed my first book, and I would like to give you this, but my question is, um, in terms of marketing my book, will the book be able to apply? Will it apply? I would say absolutely. I, I, I would say yes. Um, there are, we're not talking specifically about any particular industry, but what we talk about, the laws of leadership that we talk about, apply no matter what industry you're in. So I think it'll be helpful. Um, in terms of marketing a book, there are some real key things that we would each tell you. You can always email us. Uh, you can go on our website. You can look at certain things that we have done because we've really been learning as we've gone along. But it's been very productive and we're very excited about it. And our website is www.littleblackbookofsuccess.com. You can write us there. You can contact us about speaking events. We have something to give away, so I'd just like to we have another, we'll take more questions, but would you just reach under your seats, see if you can feel we taped something under your seat. A promo it's a card. little card, it looks like this. If you have the card, would you please let us know? Under your seat? Under your seat, and it's taped to the bottom of your seat. Did you mark it? Because otherwise I know, everybody I know, got the I know, card. I didn't think about it. Uh, no, but it's, it's taped under the seat. I didn't mark it, but that's okay. Maybe no one's sitting on that. Could well, maybe, is anybody? <laughs> she has it. Yay, okay. there she yeah. is. Come on, come on up. Come on up. You we have, have one. for you, you have one, a personal leadership notebook and a copy of the Little Black Book of Success. And she's wearing pink and black. And, and you're wearing planned. pink and black? It wasn't planned. Oh, this is fabulous. Come she's on up, not please. A <laughs> and tell us your name. Tell us your name. Tell us your Ruth, Ruth Sturdivant, and where are you from? Silver Spring, Maryland. Ruth, this is for you. Thank you. Okay. And if you have a card, here. give it to us after. Two over here. Thank you. Okay. There's another, another question. One here. Oh. Hi. Oh. Go ahead. It's Hi. My question is about assuming a leadership position as a new leader in which your predecessor has, there's been a huge, there's a huge generational gap. So what laws apply to how you as a new leader go about developing buy-in from a diverse staff that includes um, a very mixed 
staff in terms of background, experience, years, from the perspective that the previous leadership was um, of a different generation? Okay. Good question. Good question. That's a, a really good question. Part of establishing your brand yes. as a leader is by asking questions, not making any assumptions, and then doing a lot of listening. People want to know that you want to hear what they have to say. You don't have to agree, but you need to hear it. So I would say if you're going into a new department, you're going to hear, establish a list of questions that you want to find out from them so that they know that you are interested in hearing. What's worked? What hasn't? Why hasn't it worked? Yes. You want to establish yourself. And you might also do that with the predecessor, if that predecessor is still there. Oftentimes, the predecessor is still in the organization and wants to hold on <laughs> you know, every step of the way. But you want to ask a lot of questions of a lot of people. It's part of what helps you also get a sponsor. And we talk about that in the book. That's people who are sitting in the room that you're not in that are really singing your praise. So you want to be become known as that person who hears what a lot of people have to say and then acts accordingly. Your decision to make, but you want to do that not in a vacuum. I'd say that would be the first thing. And and just, go ahead. Oh, sorry, just to add to that, in addition to testing the waters with other people in your organization, also I would say we do have a chapter in a book that also talks about having a vision. You know, having a vision of what you think the organization should look like, and while you're having conversations with those people, you know, take it as an opportunity to ask them, oh, what do you think about this idea? Bring new ideas to the table and, and get feedback and reaction that way, too. It's a gathering of information that mm -hmm. you probably want to do at this stage. And we call this a listening tour. I just did this. I just took over managing one third of my department. Same thing for you. Predecessor still there. In fact, predecessor now reporting to me. So all kinds of awkwardness. And one of the things you have to learn is, again, be yourself. You know, you're still the same person that you were. You're still kind and polite. But I agree that listening is such an undervalued leadership tool. And if you really do it, you will hear things that inform your vision. You will hear things that you should keep. You will hear things that you should change. And also, you may identify some people who will play new roles in your administration. So it's going to be very important to do that. There's a young lady we, in we the We just break. have time for three more questions.